Hello, I'm Michael Slind, Senior Editor at Stanford Social Innovation Review, and I'm here with Sean Reardon, Professor of Education at Stanford University. Uh, Sean is also uh, holds the endowed professorship in poverty and inequality in education at the university, and he directs the Stanford Interdisciplinary Doctoral Training Program in Quantitative Education Policy Analysis, and that's quite a mouthful, but it indicates something very important, which is that Sean is leading an ambitious effort to explore the causal relationships between social and economic inequality on the one hand and uh, educational achievement gaps on the other hand. So, uh, Sean, I want to direct this first question to you about, and I want to focus on your work. Um, what are you and your colleagues discovering with the role that social, economic, and racial disparity plays in educational outcomes across the United States? And in, I guess it's really a really two-part question, but in, in talking about that, could you also give us a little sense of the methods that you're using to arrive at these findings? So we've been assembling test score data from every public school in the United States over the last five years or so. So that's about 200 and something million test scores. And using those to map out the patterns of academic achievement and how fast students' skills grow over time. And then relating that to conditions in local communities and local school districts to try to find out what places have higher or lower uh, outcomes for students and provide better opportunities for students than other places. So it's a big ambitious big data project that we've been working on for now four years uh, and just released the new data so we're sort of excited to see it see the light of day and i think the um the striking things that we see in the data are the enormous relationship between the socioeconomic conditions in a community and the test scores of children by the time they're in middle school and i think um the thing to keep in mind about that is that those test scores aren't just the product of the quality of the public schools in that place, but they are the product of all the opportunities that kids have had in this community. So in, the, in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in their child care centers, in their preschool programs, in after school programs, as well as in the public schools. And so I think it's important to keep in mind that these aren't measures of the quality of schools, they're measures of the sort of opportunity that are, is available to kids growing up in different neighborhoods. Well, I just want to follow up on that, just ask a little bit about the methods you're using, as I said, because I think this, that matches some intuitions that people might have had, but until recently, we might not have had the data to even ask those questions. Is that right? Right. So because uh, students in different states take different standardized tests and those tests are scored and scaled differently in different states, it's up till now been very hard to compare the performance of kids in, in a California school district to kids in a Massachusetts school district. And so what we did was develop a set of methods that would let us say, how well does a school district students rank within their own state? And then we, we link that to other data that tells us how well students in a given state rank nationally. And so we sort of stitch together these two different sources of data uh, in order to say how students in a given school district rank nationwide. And then we do a lot of extra validation work to make sure that the answers we get are actually accurate by comparing it to a, a bunch of other sources of data. So it's, a, it's sort of a complicated data wrangling <laughs> enterprise. Uh, that we spent a lot of time making sure we got right because we don't want to put out numbers that we don't believe in. Uh, for the second question, I want to maybe ask you to look, think a little more broadly about some of the implications of this research and to think broadly about the conversation today about poverty and inequality mm -hmm. in our society. Uh, it, it, you know, what's the one thing that you think people um, fail to understand when they talk about or think about poverty or inequality today that, you know, about the root causes or the core attributes of, of, of inequality? Well, I think I would, I would say a few things. One is when you're talking about inequality in education, people often attribute it to the quality of the schools. Um, and our data suggests that there are schools where kids are learning at a fast rate in poor communities, but they're still well below the national average because of it. they haven't had the chance in preschool or in uh, early childhood to really start school on an even footing. So a lot of the disparities we see across places are not the result of differences in the quality of the public schools, but really the result of early childhood opportunities. And there's a lot of new data, not just ours, that suggests that the, the kinds of communities that kids grow up in, the, the level of, of, of poverty in those places and the social conditions in those places, is a really powerful predictor, not just of how well they do in school, but, but how well they do later on in life in terms of earnings, in terms of whether or not they go to college and all sorts of things. And so, so I think when we see an educational outcome like a test score, we think the source of it must be the schools. But it's actually really, I think, driven in, in lots of ways by the kinds of communities uh, and families, opportunity, you know, opportunities that families are able to provide for their kids before they even get to the elementary system. Uh, let me shift now from talking about that problem, which you've laid out very nicely uh, and starkly, 
Um, it's talking a little bit about potential solutions. I know this maybe takes outside your academic comfort zone. It's a little bit more speculative, but is there one idea or initiative or intervention that you're aware of that you think has real potential uh, to make progress in this area to reduce uh, outcomes in, in educational performance? First thing I'd say is it's a big problem and to really tackle it, we'd have to work on lots of angles at once. We'd have to think about reducing economic inequality. We'd have to think about reducing economics and racial segregation in neighborhoods as well as schools. We'd have to think about sort of improving the quality of, of preschools and of K through 12 schools. So there's a lot of work to be done. But if I were going to sort of pick one that we know would be effective, uh, at least in moving the needle, even if it wouldn't get us all the way, I would say investments in high quality publicly funded preschool that is we know in places that have invested a lot of money in developing high quality preschool programs that that has long lasting effects that not only benefit the children who are in those programs but pay back society in terms of a return on investment uh, many times over in terms of tax uh, savings uh, and things like that so so we know from lots of other evidence that, that preschool is a great investment and there's no reason we shouldn't be doing it. Well, thanks uh, for answering our three questions today. Yeah, my pleasure. pleasure.